dag og velkommen til webinar. NTNU videre, det er deltidsstudier som er tilrettelagt sånn at du kan studere ved siden av jobb. Dagens webinar har fått titeln Designtenkning i utviklingen av menneskesentrerte tjenester, kunstig intelligens og strategier. Webinaret vil ta for seg styrken til designtenkning som prosess for problemløsning. Design bidrar til å løse komplekse utfordringer i samfunnet og næringsliv gjennom å se på menneskelige behov og teknologi i sammenheng. Virksomheter kan på denne måten utvikles ved å skape innovative og menneskesentrerte tjenester. Arsis Parmar og Hedvig Aminoff fra Institutt for Design vil lede oss gjennom dagens webinar. Arsis Parmar er første amanuensis ved Institutt for Design. Hun har 20 års erfaring som akademiker, forsker og rådgiver for bedrifter. Og Hedvig Aminoff er postdoktor ved Shore Control Lab ved NTNU. Hun er særlig opptatt av å sikre, sikre at teknologiutviklingen er i tråd med menneskelige behov. Vi vil også høre fra tre, tre tidligere studenter som har tatt videreutdanningsemner innen strategisk design og tjenesteutvikling. De her emnene kan tas enkeltvis, eller de kan inngå i en masterprogram i teknologiledelse og digital omstilling. Hele programmet er tilrettelagt sånn at du kan ta det ved siden av jobb. De her tre studentene er Kristine Ulsfjord, som til daglig jobber som digitaliseringsrådgiver i Norad, Direktoratet for utviklingssamarbeid. Det er Åsta Lindemann, som er senior designer og rådgiver i Haltenbanken. Hun er blant annet opptatt av hvordan fremveksten av ny teknologi innen AI ser ut til å kunne, drive, eh, kunne endre eh, designyrket radikalt. Og til slutt så har vi Siv Holen, som er seniorstrateg, UX-leder, produktutvikler og partner i Cantega. Eh, webinaret vil foregå på engelsk men du kan stille spørsmål både på norsk og engelsk i chatten vår, og ved å ta ordet underveis. Dersom det kommer inn flere spørsmål enn vi ikke besvar underveis, så vil vi forsøke å sende ut svar på de her spørsmålene i etterkant. Det vil bli gjort opptak av webinaret, og etter hvert vil det opptaket bli lagt på YouTube-kanalen vår. Vi vil gjerne ha tilbakemelding på hva dere synes om det webinaret, om det har vært nyttig for dere. Det vil ha betydning for vi, om vi kommer til å sette opp flere webinar i fremtiden. Vi ber derfor innstendig om at dere svarer på den korte evalueringen vi sender ut etter webinaret. Det er kun seks spørsmål, så det burde gå bra. Da sier jeg bare kos dere masse på webinar, og så skal Ashley få lov til å ta over. Thank you so much for the introduction. Very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you all for joining in. And I'm looking forward to interacting with you, even if digitally. So uh, my team is all set uh, to welcome you uh, on board. And uh, here I go. I'm Ashish, and I'm currently leading the EVU programs from Industrial Design uh, Department at NTNU. And I also take the course uh, Service Design uh, um, for Professionals um, uh, in this program. Um, before I get uh, into the business of my talking, I'd like to hear a little bit from you. So I have a quick menti quiz for you. I would like it very much if you can participate on it. You can use the code or you can use your mobile phone to answer. Have you wished that public services such as emergency handling at the hospitals uh, or community would have been more citizen-centered? Wonderful. Lovely. This tells me we are headed in the right direction. Then whatever we are aimed to discuss with you fits well. 
Let's go on to the next question. Have you ever wished that some of the strategies and services at work could be more employee centric? Wonderful. And then let's go for the last question from you. And that is, have you ever wondered how AI and other smart technologies can be shaped for the future workspaces? Wonderful. When we are talking, okay, is my full screen visible? Let's get forward. So, we have addressed these questions. That means we are talking about gearing towards citizen centered. We are looking forward for the systems to be employee centered. We are talking about future workspaces with technology. So what are the changes in the business landscape? Well, rapid technological interventions and digital transformations are shaping our societies, businesses, landscapes, and workspaces. So it's digital transformation, new technological interventions. Well, this is a very exciting time to strategize and innovate new products which are customer-centered, employee-centered, taking into consideration both changes in aspirations, which were not there a decade ago, because so many options are there. As employees, we want uh, new things. We want the correct things for ourselves. We have better aspirations. As customers, we have better aspirations. And we want to get engaged, and we want a lot of retention from the employees and hopefully from the customers. We uh, need to work cleverly. But that poses challenges as business leaders and managers as, and researchers and designers as you are all present here today. We need to adopt technologies for future scenarios and transformations. We need to strategize for customer and employee retention. We need to offer citizen services. And we need to optimize cutting edge technologies such as AR, VR, AI for personal product, personalized product offering. Well, then that puts us into the domain of complex challenges because it's not easy, right? It is complex. What do we do? We need creativity. We need loads of creativity. We need to unleash the potential because it's a complex challenge. It can't have a direct answer, right? It will have multiple answers. So then we need to innovate. We need to innovate. We need to introduce idea that can change and shape the people and organizations live and work. And to do that fits beautifully the term design because design capitalizes creativity via abductive thinking to drive innovation of products and services with user context and systems. How does it do that? Well, design is uh, the origin of the word design comes from a Latin word means to strategize, means to plan. Uh, Herbert Simon said, changing existing situations into preferred ones. And being 20 years into the discipline, I'd like to share what I believe. I believe that it is a creative and systematic problem-solving process that can envision tools, society, products, businesses in complex environment, but driving user-centered and context-sensitive innovations. So let's look at your problem solving. So business problem solving is known facts. Business leaders are trained to be risk averse and which is very important, right? So you work with known dots and you come out with solutions. You said, this is the known problem. But then when we talk about complex problems and innovative problems, not everything is known. But design is, is very strong in working with abductive thinking, which I said before, it means it works with unknown dots. It connects the unknown dots and it connects them to better understand the problem and therefore give you a plethora of solutions, which you probably didn't think of before. 
You can read more about it if you ping on my um, ID. You will get lots of publications in, in uh, how do we do design thinking in business problem solving, also apply it in pricing and service design and so forward. So when I said three contextual things are very relevant for you. One is that we are user-centered. Second is that we understand the context around the user, not only the user. So there is a whole uh, debate about just being user-focused, but we go into the context because that's such an important role. You need to understand the context of the employee, context of the user, where the problem is set, and where in the larger system it fits in. So we understand those three. We use the process which we all know or we have heard about. Stanford has commercialized it. We have double diamond, but it all boils down to a very old age design problem solving that we better understand and empathize with the user context and system. We define our problems, we ideate, we prototype and test. We do that very collaboratively, which is not in this method as you see, but we do that very collaboratively because we have a great understanding of how to work with collaborators simultaneously together to take them all through the process, all the way towards testing the solution with them. We understand the problems with them, we test the solutions with them, we do it collaboratively, we do it together, and we do it agile and iterative. That means we're very quick with populating several ideas that you can test early on rather than making the mistakes. And then it is very tangible and innovative solutions. Of course, people talk about lean processes and so on and so forth. But what is very, very important about design is that it's tangible. We come out with tangible solutions. We have tangible solutions in the form of strategy or a policy, services, or products, decision-making tools, IoT solutions solutions, AI solutions, VR, and so on and so forth. So the solutions are very, very tangible. You can feel them. That is the power of design thinking from unknown dots to coming to concrete solutions, taking care of users and context and, and your collaborators and coming down. That's the power of design. Some are very quick applications of design thinking in innovative projects. As you can see here, these are some of my own projects. It's a Coral App, which works on innovative decision-making tool for menstrual tracking and athlete performance. So it's a decision-making tool. It's done with the same process of design thinking. I have my collaborators who are specialists in sports, and we work to develop such solutions. It's on um, uh, App Store. You can download and you can use it as well. And so on uh, in complex problems like uh, obesity. How do you tackle obesity? How do you tackle that? Uh, there are so many ways you can tackle that to come out with solutions, which are decision support systems, which can work on that. Again, the team is with health experts. The team is with, uh, with all of us and all of hospital. So it's tangible solutions applied there. Um, when we look at services, the range is, is broader. If you look at the uh, top uh, picture, you can see it's a national pathway for chronic pain patients. It's together with NAFS, Healthy, and Norge, and uh, also St. Olaf Hospital. How do you create a new service which can uh, better assist the chronic pain patients all the way from the treatment, all the way till they get support from NAV or from the hospital? It's very complex, a lot of information exchange between the stakeholders. How do you take care of that? So um, we work on services or we work on tangible solutions, which are um, advanced technologies of intraoperative visualization systems for surgeons and so on and so forth. So these are all tangible solutions coming out. So that's the power of design and the, uh, the spectrum is very broad. Uh, as I told you, I work on PD6009, that service design innovation for professionals. And uh, here is very interesting that my current ongoing class, which I offer in spring, is dealing with certain problems, as stated before. Just look at this problem, designed for youth-centered career council services for youth retention in Bidragona School. So this is two teams have come together. It's Directorate of Higher Education and Tron Time Commune. Both are facing the problem and two organizations have come together in my class and we solve this problem live. So all of the courses, most of the courses that we offer at NTNU, they, they are live in design. So you bring your problems and you uh, understand our method and you apply it live and you take home live. And these are some of the problems, even in Norwegian Defense Estate Agency, uh, uh, it's working on, um, the colleague is working on employee center digital services for defense call center. So these are, uh, these are some of the problems that we are working on in the class as we speak and live problems, which may be of relevance to you. And these are some example of previous projects. So when I say uh, live projects, so um, if you look at this, Health Say West had come out with the problem of uh, designing service design in digital 
hospitalization of patient administration of chemotherapy for nurses. So you have to understand how the nurse uh, workflow happens, how the chemotherapy is actually administered, what kinds of processes happen, what kind of softwares are being used, what is the physical access to the whole thing, to the principal. And then look at the softwares. Service is much larger. It's a constituent of physical spaces, of people, of stakeholders, and also softwares. Everything is integrated together. So when I say the teams are built in the course, they have a life problem. They have to go through the entire process ground up and come out with tangible solutions, which they test it again live with the nurses in this case. So this is one of the examples which was done um, by um, a team of three, Theresa and Rajit and Stina in 2022. This is another one. It is to service design to enable effective transplant, uh, um, a transparent licensing process for energy. Again, um, the entire service is mapped and you come out with concrete tangible solution in the form of an app in this case, where you can uh, see how the licensing process can be optimized. So these are some thoughts from my side. Over to you, Hedvig. Okay. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Ashes. Um, I'm a researcher in human and computer interaction, also the coordinator of the AI and design thinking course. And as you described, Ashes, we're in this transformative period where businesses are trying to find ways to embrace also AI. And we propose that AI and design thinking together provide this powerful toolkit AI brings all these powers of enhanced data processes and design thinking, as you described, Ashes, is this the systematic way of investigating problems. And it's a way towards generating solutions which are user-centric and meet these real-world needs. We think that design thinking and AI co combination can help organizations stay really competitive and future ready, but it's also a way for professionals to remain relevant and impactful in their individual roles. So in the next few minutes, I'll be discussing some of the AI challenges we're facing and also the concept of human-centered AI. And also be looking at a few, a few AI projects that illustrate design thinking principles in action. So we can go to the next slide. So, what we see is AI opening up these new worlds of possibility and AI is really leading the charge into this digital transformation. Um, I think it, there's, you, I think you skipped one slide, thank you. Um, yeah, AI is leading this charge into digital transformation and we're gonna be seeing new ways of working, new roles and new tasks. And my view is that AI is here, we have to embrace it and run with it. And this means that both individuals and organizations need to find agile ways to meet this transformation because things, so many things are happening now and we don't know where, really where it's going, just that things are changing very fast. And some companies are really well into their AI journey. They've been building and investing in AI for a while. They have substantial capabilities, a data ecosystem, a technology ecosystem, along with these new ways of working. And we can see some typical high profile capabilities uh, to building, for example, autonomous vehicles or robots for inspecting enclosed spaces in the oil and gas industry. But AI isn't just about these highly visible flashy innovations. It's a way also to develop operational processes. Some large industries, for example, are using AI to enable new design and engineering processes. And in this way, they can achieve new efficiency, safety, and sustainability outcomes. For example, designing components which are stronger but also use fewer resources. However, many organizations are just now beginning to seriously consider their AI strategy, and others are still deciding if how AI fits into their business or if at all. And this hesitation is understandable because the AI com landscape is really com complex and it's also changing so fast. So one of the major challenges in integrating AI into businesses is this rapid pace of technological change. It's really tough to keep up with AI developments and also understand the applications. And of course, companies have to innovate while remaining profitable. So AI has to also demonstrate a clear value. In addition, we have this issue of timing because moving too early or too late can really have consequences here. 
We have ethical cons considerations as well. We've seen biases and training data that can result in technologies that perpetuate racism and sexism. And Google's model, Gemini, recently demonstrate the complexity of addressing bias because it tried to avoid generating too many images of white men. But this led to a backlash and an apology from Google because the, the, it instead generated very controversial Im images. We also see that AI can, technologies can have these inherent security vulnerabilities, including risks of hacking or data poisoning. And they, there's also this, what they call a hallucination problem, because we see models fabricating information, and misinterpreting data. And on top of all this, we also see evolving regulations and standards for AI. So governments and international bodies are introducing new laws. So while businesses are tr still trying to understand if and how they're going to use AI, there are also these demands for regulatory compliance, which in themselves are not well understood yet. So this is really makes it a daunting landscape. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. But we're suggesting that design thinking is a way to tackle this complexity because it provides a, a framework to address really complex challenges, which focuses on defining, defining problems, innovating solutions, and evolving through user feedback. This is also a mindset which can help organizations stay ahead in this sort of rapidly changing landscape. And when it, when it comes to identifying AI opportunities, there are different approaches there as well, because this can be this can be spotting gaps in areas that need improvement and figuring out if we can use AI to address it. But it can also be about finding new ways of making use of existing technology and data to unlock fresh value streams or improved operations. For example, uh, how to leverage generative AI in the new organizational role or how you can use it to interface with legacy systems. But why we see the we, while we're seeing all these um, these opportunities, we see new risk also with AI advancements. For instance, we know that generative AI can be really unpredictable. We still don't really know how these um, how these models work. There are discussions about what can GPT four do and can't do, and how does it do things. We don't really understand all the details of deep learning. We've also seen totally new risks emerge. For example, Meta's Quest virtual reality system, hackers were able to hijack users' headsets, steal sensitive information, and also with generative AI, they could manipulate social interactions, which was really hard to imagine these risks ahead of time. And this not only illustrates the importance of cybersecurity, of course, it also points to the need of what we call requisite imagination. You need a certain kind of imagination and also a systematic process to be able to picture these types of new risks. Then again, as I mentioned, we have these legal challenges which complicate matters. We have high profile AI missteps, such as biased image generation, inappropriate chatbot, interactions, all these also underscore this need for robust testing, ethical considerations, and user-focused design and AI development. We also have really serious cases where we have the Rotterdam fraud detection algorithm as a disaster in the Netherlands, where a system led to false fraud accusations and really severe social repercussions, which exemplifies the catastrophic effects of over-reliance of te technology if you don't have the proper checks. So while, while we have the EU AI Act now, it regulates high-risk AI uses. The practical application of these laws are still uncertain. And to overcome these complex issues, we think design issue, design thinking can encourage this necessary multidisciplinary approach, which you also mentioned, Ashes, where we try, we get to talk to different professions and integrate technical, ethical, regulatory, business expertise and in this way, develop responsible, secure, and effective AI solutions. And this is where we come to talk about human-centered AI, and it's really a natural extension of design thinking because it, it, it emphasizes how we need to create AI systems 
and ensure that the technology is usable, it's accessible, but also that it's explainable, that people understand how do how did these results come, how were these results generated? And then we these issues about ethics and authority, responsibility, et cetera, that these are addressed proactively. So it's not you're not just surprised uh, once once you're actually implementing a product. Just want to say a few words also about the uh, the course we have, which is AI and design thinking, because here we teaching how to harness the potential of AI while also addressing these various types of challenges and really trying to keep a human-centered focus. And throughout this period, uh, with a variety of lectures and practical exercises, the participants apply their knowledge to innovation projects. And this is a way of anchoring this theoretical learning in practical experience and also the conceptual design of an AI service or product. So I'd just like to round off with sharing two great examples from our course that both had the aim to enha enhance decision-making and also resource management in the, in the public sector. On the left is a project that seeks to develop a data-driven method to improve road maintenance. The current system still depends on manual inspections, but they had a lot of data. And the group explored whether AI could lead to more efficient strategies that considered the whole the road's full life cycle. This was a really broad question, and the design thinking process helped the, helped them narrow it down. This involved a lot of stakeholder interviews with many different professions, and led to a, a, a precise problem statement about employing AI to automate the assessment of road edges and a and a prototype which they actually tested and also got a lot of feedback on. And the right side project aimed at predicting and preventing water leakages. They also started with this broad goal about enhancing public services through AI. And with the design thinking process, they narrowed the problem down and developed an AI model that combines data from infrastructure, meteorological data, leakage history data, and was a way of promoting more strategic municipal operations. And here again, they. Uh, talked to many disciplines and they got a lot of user feedback and did several iterations and, and got very good feedback on their final product. So both these products use design thinking to develop concepts. And we also have two participants from our last course who are here to share their insights and, and experiences. But before we dive into that, I'd like to hand the word back to you, Ashes. Thank you, Hedvig. And, uh... Over to Christine. So we have Christine who has taken the PD6009 service design for professions course last year. With us, Christine is a leader in NORAD. And uh, Christine, over to you. Would you like to introduce yourself and perhaps say some of the professional challenges you are facing and, uh, and the design knowledge that you learned and how you are applying it? I'm very uh, keen and we all are to learn from you. Thank you, Ashish. So I can just uh, start with explaining a bit deep briefly what NORAS does, because that make, might make it easier for people to understand the challenges uh, that I'm in. So I'm a part of a small digitalization department in NORAD. We work with uh, development corporations, so with partners around the world, trying to solve not a minor uh, uncomplicated problem, but uh, poverty, basically. So quite complex. Um, but in general, what we do uh, on the everyday is try to fi figure out how the Norwegian state best could put their state uh, aid budget into use to solve these issues. So it's a public sector uh, grant management. Uh, and uh, most of my time uh, as a digitalization advisor, I'm a potato. Uh, I do everything that needs to be done. And I also lead a team of other people working with digitalization. Uh, a, uh, a few of the challenges that I see where we have applied uh, service design is actually introducing service design as a concept to the organization. Because uh, two years ago, uh, we had zero service designers in NORAD. Uh, we got one uh, who then had to try to build the subject in the organization. No one knew what it was. They didn't know what they could get out of it. They didn't know how to use it. 
So then we have to try to set our self in their situation and how we would convey to them what this subject was and how it was would be fruitful for them. So that was kind of our first service design project was how to introduce service design to an organization that hasn't heard about it before. Um, uh, since then, we've used it in a multitude of projects. I'm going to just briefly describe a few of them. One was uh, a challenge we had that we see that uh, most of our the grants that we give out are based on applications uh, and we have to assess them. And this is usually done manual by a case handler. And a lot of the partners that we work with, we use uh, several times, like uh, the Red Cross or the World Health Organization and such. But we evaluate them every time. So we said, OK, we can reuse this data. We just have to figure out why. And that was also one of the first projects I worked with uh, as after I took the course with uh, Ashish. So that was super useful, both to uh, uh, have that knowledge then and user centricity. Because I worked as a product manager and product owner with product development for a lot of years, but I never had that methodical foundation uh, which I got from the course. And then we had quite a funny one where every time we grant money to someone, we have to uh, have a statistical code so that it can be reported somewhere. And uh, we saw that this code became wrong so many times. And uh, the people who owned this process, they said, oh, this probably because the manual is very hard to read. So we did a little product, turned out manual, the manual wasn't hard to read, but no one knew it existed. But, so we had a completely wrong hypothesis. But what's also interesting with that was that we spent a bit of time on insight on this. And we did a few uh, improvements to the manual too. So now that manual is so good that we now figured out we can use AI to do the thing instead. Because it's now actually a rule book that we could actually mm. use AI on. So now we don't have mm. to do that manual work anymore. So the insight was so useful, even though it didn't actually end up being the solution to the problem that we thought we had. Mm. And this is the thing, because as a, both as a, uh, someone that delivers a service to the organization, as a leader, you constantly get introduced into challenge test, challenges that you have to solve. And some of them seem easy, but you, and you think you know the answer, but then you don't really know. And a lot of the times, there are a lot of people that has an interest. Like now, we're trying to induce a new uh, process when it comes to portfolio management. And there are so many stakeholders to this project that has their concerns. Some are worried about losing control. Some are aware, worried about enough, not enough control. And have is that uh, like uh, customer employment centric perspective in that process has led us to avoid so many communication challenges that we otherwise would have would have had when we try to introduce a process that hasn't been there before. So that's probably some of the challenges and the cases with, uh, where we worked on uh, um, since I took the class. Thank you, Christine. This is uh, really, uh, again, back to the power of uh, abductive thinking, where uh, you spend so much of time understanding the problem and some problems are valuable and some problems that you throw away are still valuable. And even the lessons that you hard learn, then their failures become new challenges. And that's uh, so beautifully you've uh, presented. Hedvig, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have Osta Lindemann and C.F. Holen here who have taken the AI and design thinking course. And I'd like to invite you if you could introduce yourselves and if you'd like to share some of the challenges you're facing today. And <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Siv. Uh, I work as a UX lead uh, and a manager in Cantega, which is a con IT consultant company. I'm a manager for 16 UX design consultants, which are working for big companies in Oslo. Uh, in Contega, we see that uh, more and more customers want to use AI and they come to us for help. Uh, but we, what I see is that their focus is mostly on the technology and not so much on the users who are supposed to use these uh, mm -hmm. solutions. Um, it's like, I feel sometimes it's like uh, 15 years ago where everybody wanted to have an app. We need an app, but they didn't care that much about what the app if it would solve the problem or not. I think we're kind of there when it comes to AI. Everybody wants to use AI, but they're not so, <laughs> they're not digging deep enough into which problem are they actually going to, to solve. 
So my focus is on how design can help AI projects because we can do so much more than make services look nice. That is what they usually say. Well, there's no front end on this, so we don't need you. Uh, that's one uh, problem we see. Uh, machine learning is a new technology that brings new experiences to the users. Uh, the machines uh, behave differently than we're used to. And the biggest difference from classic programming is that AI gives us predictions, which are based on statistics and probability. And they might predict wrong. You get false positives, you get false negatives. Uh, and you have to prepare the users for that, and you have to have a solution for fixing that. And another thing is that the product can learn from the user's actions. That means that the, the product won't behave the same every time. It might change its behavior uh, based on how I use uh, the service. So that brings uh, a lot of new challenges to UX designers as well. So we have to, uh, as UX designers or designers, we have to consider the impact of machine learning when it comes to user needs, is AI the best thing, a solution to, uh, does it give unique value to the users? And then there's these mental models because people have uh, uh, different expectations to what the solution will, will do. And we have to uh, find out what kind of mental models does the users have so that we can prepare them and we can teach them and set the mm -hmm. right expectations for the system. And then there's trust. There's a lot of thing going on with AI. Uh, how can we explain that this is that you can trust this system and how can you model confidence for them? And then there's a the data collection. Uh, what kind of data do, do they use to train the dot to train the the model? Uh, and does the that is the data the right thing to solve the problem that we're trying to solve, or is it just the data we had? And then there's feedback because we're going to uh, all these models, machine learning, uh, um, we'll learn from how we behave. So we have to, but we have to gather that information. We have to gather that information in a use uh, user-friendly way so that they don't get bored and they just stop giving the feedback. And then there's of course uh, the, the false uh, the negatives and the false positives, all the errors uh, that we might uh, see uh, in the product because it is based on predictions and we have to prepare the users for that. And we have to make uh, nice, because we can't fix those problems. We can't fix a false negative. It's not like you can go in and, and uh, fix a bug like we do in the traditional systems. Uh, so we have to make, make sure that the user can still complete its task, even though the machine learn model did wrong prediction. So how can we help them get on with a problem? And I think that design thinking is a perfect tool to address these areas. Thank you. I think this was really interesting to hear because I I hear you uh, illustrating these principles and concepts from human-centered AI with really uh, with really fresh examples, and also these challenges of this uh, achieving a multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. And um, I mean. Uh, I'm thinking also how can you manage to to introduce design thinking into these assignments when when they're actually saying oh we don't we don't need this aspect of design so I can imagine that that's a challenge mm. um, but uh, and also you're mentioning these uh, special uh, challenges also for designers who also need this competence and understanding of what can AI do and what can't it do, et cetera. Mm, yeah. But uh, also I'd like to invite uh, Osta in. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Osta and I am working as a senior designer and uh, advisor at a company called Haltenbanken in Bergen. It's a classic brand agency and we mostly work on helping different companies uh, tell their stories in a way that can be convincing and truthful. Uh, so usually we work as problem solvers uh, and we do a lot of very different types of tasks. We both work in uh, rooms in like the physical space and we work uh, on digital 
surfaces and also printed matter and everything else considered to be a part of a brand agency uh, portfolio. So um, uh, one of my tasks in the agency is that I'm supposed to be in charge of uh, raising the knowledge of uh, service design in the whole company. And this is one of the reasons why I find it really interesting to take the course that I did. Uh, also because AI is really interesting. And I think it's going to change the way that uh, the design uh, business works and uh, what services that we can offer. Um, what we have, uh, we, what is kind of interesting is that we have kind of two different roles or problems or solutions, I don't really know. Uh, we both are, as a designer, we, you are both like a consumer of these AI services. So we use AI as a tool, but we are also advisors on what our clients are supposed to do with AI. So we both need to understand how, what it is and how it works and what's the limitations and what's the problems and also what's the benefits of using AI in projects. And we need to know it quite thoroughly. Um, and, but we are also uh, consumers of these uh, services by using these image generation uh, generators and text generators in our projects. And that makes us able to um, provide uh, illustrations and texts that uh, on a, a very short time that has quite high um, quality. Uh, that maybe the client couldn't afford within their budgets before. So that's kind of a game changer on, on that level. But that means that we also need to know uh, a lot of, about the ethics in it and uh, mm -hmm. property um, ownership uh, and also um, what limitations it has. So since, uh, since last year, uh, we have started using AI in our projects uh, with uh, very interesting uh, learning from it. We had one project where we try to visualize um, a bank history by generating these uh, personas from the bank history, uh, where we found, for instance, that we try to make it uh, make a farmer from the 1800s in Norway, in Jaren. And it gave us a lot of female farmers and it gave us black farmers and it gave us a lot of strange <laughs> farmers, but it couldn't provide us with a, a white male farmer, which was like <laughs> what we thought it might should be then. Mm -hmm. And also it's kind of, uh, we, we tried to make it uh, write us excerpts from the history. And then it started inventing which banks that had um, merged with other banks. So it just, told us silly stories that we uh, fortunately knew weren't true. So it's it's about knowing these kind of uh, problems where you can face and not just be completely uh, uh, saying that this is true. But we have also launched another, we are launching to, uh, now uh, another profile where we have used AI to provide us with illustrations that the, we absolutely didn't have time to make for this project. And, and that it's sounds, uh, it's it's so interesting hearing you, Osta. I'd like to talk more and also hear more of your examples because I mean, you, what you're really describing is this enormously changing landscape, both yeah. in the products, but also in, in work, in how you conduct work. And, um, but I'll have to hand the word over to Ashes again Sorry. because we're gonna open the panel, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, that has been, uh, uh... A lovely learning for all of us. So now we uh, we throw the panel uh, open to the audience. And uh, here we are. You've heard some of our thoughts and uh, some of what we offer in our courses, some of what we think uh, in terms of design uh, as a process, as a complex problem service, not only for, uh, for technology, but also for bringing services, for strategies, for so much more. Um, my challenge to you is, and to the public forum is, of course, we address any of your queries, but also, uh, what are the challenges you are facing in technology and services and innovation and adoption towards making it customer-centric, employee-centric? Um, so uh, we are looking forward to hearing your questions. You can type them. You can unmute yourself and just say it out. Let's have it uh, very interactive. 
um, let us know. I can start with a few you also because one uh, one person picked up of one of my suggestions on this question in the chat and that's the challenges with shit in shit out and that with this eagerness to jump on the ai train people jump to ai without having looked at data in advance and then they very quickly meet two challenges silos because everyone's been building data in their separate places, making it very hard to get a holistic overview of the employee or customer or whoever you're putting in the front seat uh, and the quality. Um, and then there are some other which are just the usual challenges is the, especially in the public sector, I see um, that the user is an unknown word because there's no competition. You can't uh, choose to get your grants mm -hmm. money from anyone else. You can't choose not to use the tax department. So just being able to people to get the people that work in the public sector to understand who is their user, other than the, the like the government above them, is a, it's a journey in the beginning. Uh, yes. So I'll stop with those to leave some room for some other people too. Yes. You can pose your question or unmute yourself and uh, share your challenges. Let us know if you can address any of uh, your queries. What are the steps you are taking to make it uh, innovative in your area? What difficulties you're facing? Do you think design can uh, support you? Okay, we have um, a comment. Uh, I think in many applications, it is still important to have explainable AI. How do you see that working out in human-centered mind? Uh, I'm thinking for the trust in AI to be there. Uh, yes, um, uh, Stephen, trust. Trust in any technology. You walk into the plane, you want to trust it. You walk into your Tesla, you want to trust it. Trust in technology takes time, takes robustness, robustness takes um, a high level of proficiency. AI uh, in its uh, form is still a baby. It's taking its baby steps because the data is so impure. The data that we have fed in it is, is of course, with biases, as we've heard, but still has is impure. We are, we are creating data as we speak, um, and we have retro data. We are struggling with getting it live data and so on and so forth. So um, this trust is a whole big chapter. We have to address it uh, depending on how quickly we will address the biases. Then you will have a robust algorithm them and then go forward. I was working as a consultant in one of the companies who was working with AI for infant and identifying uh, uh, early um, early disease in infants. But the data that they were using was sort of uh, in not in the right light uh, for different kinds of color gradients of, of skin colors and so on and so forth. So it kept giving them the wrong directions. Uh, so it's the, it's the core data that you feed and gets the trust higher. I would like uh, to hear from um, Trig and uh, others uh, to comment on this before we can uh, uh, go to uh, Frig. Would you like to raise your question? Uh, it wasn't a question, it was just a comment. Uh, I was just thinking of the um, uh, one of the um, lecturers at uh, the course that you held uh, was one guy that were working on this uh, uh, small boat going over the river in Trondheim and that they needed to work on the different signals this boat was giving to make the passengers feel safe that this boat that is un, uh, doesn't have a people running it uh, to to be trusting of the boat so that was a really interesting lecture that that was in the course um, on that topic Edvik, any more thoughts on explainable ai here to uh, address yeah. Stephen's query I think, I mean, it, this explainability, it, it, it comes in on, on several different layers because we have this understanding of where the data is coming from and what's being done with it and how, and, but we also, uh, we also have aspects of like the user interface. So it's, there are many aspects. And I mean, this was one of the things that Steve and, and uh, Osta were also talking about. How do we communicate? How do we, how do we, uh, uh, communicate these aspects for uh, an end user. So explainability has to do with many, many aspects of, of the 
uh, of the whole development process. But uh, it is it is really an, an important part, and it, it, this is also really tightly uh, tightly connected to things like authority and responsibility, also because we talk about responsibility gap. If an operator is using a system with AI and he gets a result that he can't explain, who is responsible? That puts everybody in a very difficult position. So we have many layers of explainability, and that's really an important concept. We are also very keen to know from the audience uh, more of their views. Uh, if, you, uh, if you think that you're facing certain challenges that you think uh, what you've heard from design fitting you, um, or there is some knowledge that you need to know that we can prepare because we also create new courses as we speak. This year, we plan to launch two more courses from our department. So uh, if you, if you uh, raise some queries here or unmute yourself, uh, it would be very nice to share some thoughts on that. Okay, yes, Steve. Yes, Steve, go ahead. You've raised your hand. Yeah, I was, um, uh, was uh, wondering uh, if I would take uh, more, uh, I would like to take more courses on Antenna. I thought it was really interesting and very. Um, and raised my knowledge a lot. And uh, if I could come with a, a wish, then it's uh, more uh, courses in the line of the, the one AI and design thinking, uh, how to apply this uh, new technology. And both from the perspective as knowing what it is, be uh, because it was like, just like a, on, on the surface, it felt like uh, it, since the course, it, com it has a lot of content, uh, but also in what... Um, what the kind of uh, appliances? Where could it be applied, and and how to to use a different design methodology into this uh, new technology? It's a uh, it's a groundbreaking technology, so it's uh, just a half a year of course isn't kind of covering. So that would be a very good uh, approach to it. Thank you. We have uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Amanda. What sort of challenges do you think design thinking could be a part of solving that we might not associate with design thinking and design? Um, well, hey, you have partly answered your question uh, as I began with it. Um, design itself means problem solving to strategize. When the word design thinking was commercialized by the good old Americans, they forgot that design itself is thinking and problem solving. They've just added another redundant word to it and said design thinking and commercialized it. So design, when you say design, you strategize, you can design your date, you can design your day, you can design your life, you can design strategies, you can design policies, you can design buildings, you can design everything. Do not restrict your thinking towards technology. What we teach is the ground fundamentals to address, and that's what I began, that it comes out with tangible solutions. The solutions do not have to be only technology-based or product-based, but it could be the whole policy. Like, for example, I'm working on national framework policy towards how patients are going to be treated. So it's much more than that. Right. And once you have done that strategic part, thinking part, then you get into very specialized courses in design, which you can go in UX, you can go in furniture design, you can go in very specifics of it to come out with concrete solutions. Right. Christine, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, because uh, this is one of the things that I find uh, quite intriguing with having introduced service design in order that some of the things that we work on are really hard challenges. So like one now on my service designers are working with our departments to try to figure out if we can use the grants that we do with partners in Afghanistan to help um, women in Afghanistan take have the ability to take more responsibility uh, uh, to take more responsibility about how aid is delivered in Afghanistan. And then you have to balance that with that we still have it to meet. Uh, and you can hypothesize that it may, this maybe have something to do with how Hamas would like women to act. 
and we still have to be able to deliver aid there. So we can't do it in a way that provokes them so much that we aren't able to do our job. But can we in some way manage to still push this agenda of gender equality in management positions in Afghanistan while distributing aid? And these type of uh, challenges is one of the, it's the most exciting things that we work on in service design here with NORAD. And I know also that CEDA, our equivalent in Sweden, they have worked on how they, together with the civil society organizations, can work practically to change the narrative around human rights and gender equality in Turkey. So these are uh, these are huge challenges where service design is um, uh, so rewarding, especially if you try to connect it with systemic design. This is uh, uh, this is so interesting, and maybe maybe places where thought people thought that service designs wasn't the solution to the challenge. We have a, a comment uh, from uh, Sid Maria. She says that we use this specially for to build on what Christine and I said. We use this specially for. Uh, uh, team and operational design of deliveries and all that we are mentioning. So thank you, Sun, for that heads up. Uh, we have another question. Uh, uh, are there ways to rate the results presented and present this uh, based on the strengths of synapses in the net networks? I think um, what you're meaning in terms of uh, results presented and rating is uh, when we talk about ideation and decision matrices. So once we have concepts or solutions which could be tangible, um, we very quickly have heuristic evaluations to with the expert teams. Like I said, we, we involve the stakeholders. We very quickly involve the stakeholders to rate on ideas uh, through decision matrices, through series of, of uh, interactions with them, and then finalize the final concept, create a tangible solution, and then go for series of testings again, very agile. Low fertility and high fertility depends on it. So we have series of testings to get there. Um, um, I have another question. I think uh, perhaps um, others would like to attend. It says, uh, if you see Mahalingam's questions, I use chat GPT to find information without using Google. Okay. This gives me a challenge to validate information. Several times the information from chat GPT looks very real and, and it come naked, but the user needs to know about data to validate it if the information is true. Here, how can a person without knowledge filter the chat GPT information? Ha, ah. ha, ah. that's a rather long uh, Longest, uh, longest answer, and uh, it requires a lot of uh, NLPs or uh, national or uh, language processing to be able to identify the hints of what is real and not real. Edvik, would you like to uh, throw some thought on that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Because I mean, I think this is here we're coming to these sort of unanticipated effects of new technologies because we're seeing this information that looks very real and that, but it's problematic because I mean these models are unpredictable and then we get this new new user need really and uh, this is coming into these issues of explainability transparency and trust again to communicate to the user how is this information how is this information generated but it's also, I think your question also shows a really interesting aspect of the design thinking process, which is also having these feedback processes also after deployment, because these are new technologies, we're seeing new uses, emergent uses and emergent outcomes. And so it's important also when developing a service to continue having feedback processes to learn about the new uses and have a continual uh, improvement. Yeah, it's, an, it's a really interesting question, but we don't have an easy answer to this. Yeah. What is real and unreal? Well, that's a very interesting debate to end our session now. I will uh, hand to Anna Grimm. Uh, thank you very much for interacting with us. Thank you for your time. We take courses. And TNU Vidre will be informing you very shortly about the courses we take in spring and in fall uh, in our department and many more new to come. I hope you log on to them. Over to, uh, thank you for our panelists. Thank you for the team for being there and listening to us. Over to Anna Green. Tusen takk, Ashis. Da håper jeg alle sammen har fått litt av hvert å tenke på. Så igjen, takk til Ashis, takk til Hedvig. Særlig takk til tidligere studenter Kristine, Åsta og Siv. Og takk til alle dere som har vært med og hørt på, og særlig til dere som har bidratt med spørsmål og kommentarer. Veldig artig. Presentasjonen vil bli sendt ut, og det vil også etter hvert bli mulig å se opptaket fra denne webinaret. 
Husk nu også at give tilbagemelding. Eh, dere vil snart få en e-post, eh, hvor dere finner lenke til evalueringsskjema, og det som sagt kun seks spørsmål, tar det et halvt minutt å svare på det her. Og så håper jeg vi har den glede å se dere igen på et nytt webinar senere, eller kanskje gjerne også som videreutdanningsstudent hos oss. Ha en fitt, fortsatt fin dag alle sammen, og takk for nå.